Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rebecca Kiesling, and welcome to BRI's virtual event series. This is our first event in June. And again, my name is Rebecca Kiesling, and I am the program director here at Benjamin Rush Institute, which just means that I get the fantastic job of working with all of our chapters throughout the country and uh, around the world. We are streaming live both on um, here on Zoom, but also on Facebook and on our Twitter page. So if you're joining us, um, anywhere in the country and in the world, welcome. Um, we do, I do see some of our chapter leaders um, and a few of our students. So um, thank you for joining us. I know people are pretty much Zoomed out by now. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm thankful to everybody who has supported us as we move to a completely virtual environment. This isn't, being virtual isn't something that we had to really struggle with a lot. Um, when COVID-19 hit, uh, we have had virtual events um, and been streaming our events for about almost two years now. Um, as one event happened at a chapter, we were streaming those events to other chapters throughout the country, holding virtual events. Um, sometimes, you know, those would be book clubs. Sometimes those would be with some of our fantastic speakers. So moving to completely virtual has, was pretty seamless for us. Uh, Benjamin Rush Institute has been around over nine years promoting free market healthcare alternatives to student, medical students throughout the world. Um, it's more important now than ever to get that education out to our students as we can see, because this, what has happened in the world uh, over the past 100 plus days um, is directly impacting how they will practice medicine. Um, and we need those students to not only have an education in that, but also understand that they can advocate in whatever way they choose so they will have a direct impact in making sure that they practice the medicine that they want to so that they can um, make sure that their the doctor-patient relationship is strong. Um, the, there was a Washington Post article on May 21st that asked the question, why don't hospitals have enough PPE? They said, because the pandemic broke the market. There are many of us that would say that the market was broke long before that. And we are so excited to welcome Dr. Marion Mass today to talk about the broken healthcare supply chain and how to fix it. Dr. Mass graduated from medical school at Duke University. She completed her internship and residency at Northwestern University's uh, Robert Lurie Children's Hospital in Chicago. Dr. Mass has worked in the Philadelphia area as a pediatrician for 21 years. She is the co-founder of Practicing Physicians of America, serves on the board of Bucks County Health Improvement Partnership, serves on the editorial board of the Bucks County Courier Times Doylestown Intel. She is a delegate to the Pennsylvania Medical Society and is a board member of Restoring American Community Safely. Dr. Mass is a mom and is married to a surgeon, and we are so excited to welcome her here today. And um, I'm going to now turn it over to Dr. Mass. Hi, my pleasure to be here today. I know we're going to um, discuss the broken healthcare supply chain. Um, Rebecca, just so for my own uh, knowledge of how this proceeds. I, I'm imagining you'll be forwarding the questions to me, if, should any come through? Sure, you, we can do it either way you want. I can forward them to you or uh, via the, uh, per, the private chat, or uh, if you'd like, we can just hold off and I can, I can get back on and ask them, we can ask them later. Yeah, however, however you want to do sure. it. I suppose you want me to start with a, maybe an overview of some of the problems in the healthcare supply chain? All right. Does that work out well? Okay. So um, as part of Practicing Physicians of America and some of the work that I've done with the coalition called Free to Care, uh, and you can look that up, and Benjamin Rush is part of the Free to Care Coalition as well. That is free, the number two, and care. Um, one of the issues that we've been bringing to the attention of Americans, um, patients and physicians and policy shapers is the fact that we do not have a working American healthcare supply chain. 
Um, for about two years now, I've been going down to Washington, D.C. and informing senators and congressmen that our supply chain has been corrupted and broken. Um, there sits in the supply chain causing some obstruction the healthcare supply middlemen, um, and those come in two forms, you know, basically. Uh, for the hospital supply chain, uh, and this actually includes the nursing homes as well, there's what we call the group purchasing organizations, GPOs. Um, GPOs are the controllers of what gets into hospitals and nursing homes, not just drugs and not just solutions like saline and bicarb water and the things you need to hydrate your patients and to make sure dialysis gets done. Um, not, not just medications like epinephrine and uh, medications um, such as anesthetics and chemotherapeutics, but also healthcare supply, like the PPE that we were missing. Um, in addition, all other types of supplies, bandages, oxygen tubing, medical devices, all of these are kind of under the thumb of group purchasing organizations. Um, and I, I always go back and uh, talk about the history of how our supply chain became so defunct. Um, so in the 1920s, group purchasing organizations formed because hospitals were becoming places where people got needed care. And, you know, of course, if we think all the way back to when we had the flu pandemic um, right before 1920, hospitals became places that people relied on, needed, and trusted. And, you know, they needed bandages, they needed bedpans, they needed all kinds of objects and implements in hospitals. And in the 1920s in New York, the first group purchasing organization formed. And over years, they grew in number and they grew in stature. And what group purchasing organizations were and remained for a long time was kind of like a Costco for hospitals and nursing homes. So, you know, you get a membership at Costco if you know, you're going out shopping and you want stuff in bulk. If you're a hospital or a nursing home, you've got a membership with a group purchasing organization. And then you could go down the, the lines uh, in their catalog, you know, just like we go down the lines in Costco and say, okay, I'll take this many of this kind of bandages and I'll take this many of, of this kind of bedpan. And uh, as we started using IV solutions, I need this IV tubing, I need that normal saline, I need this calcium solution. As we got antibiotics, and you know that got added to the list, and as medical devices changed, so group purchasing organizations worked to consolidate so that hospitals could go to one location. I mean, I, I guess I picture them as people that have like a rolodex full of all of the suppliers in the United States. This actually worked out well because hospitals could get bulk discounts; they could join up together in like little consortiums and get a good bulk discount. Where things went wrong um, in 1987, stuffed into the 1987 Medicare and Medicaid Patient Protection Act was a very little known statute. And the number, I, it's irrelevant, I have it somewhere. Uh, but that statute allowed that group purchasing organizations could then get money from the suppliers and not have it count as a kickback. Um, in a recent Vanity Fair article that I was quoted at, in, they, they used what I call the iced tea comparison. And the iced tea comparison is this, is, you know, I'm in the Philadelphia region, as mentioned, and we have Wawa here. I suppose you have Sheets and, you know, 7-Elevens around the country. But if iced tea companies were allowed to pay off Wawa and they could then buy market share in Wawa, you probably would get one iced tea company that would purchase the sole source right to have their product be the only product in Wawa, and then they could charge what they want. And over time, um, that's exactly what's happened to the healthcare supply chain. So when group purchasing organizations that supply needed supplies, drugs, devices, um, solutions, and PPE to hospitals and nursing homes, when they were given the right to receive kickbacks and not get prosecuted, which is of course illegal in every other industry in America, then what started happening is suppliers started jockeying for more and more market share. Now, we can talk a little bit later about how some of this is hidden, but over time, we started to see drug and solution shortages. And here's why. Um, 
if, especially with injectable drugs, you know, like if, if we compare swallowing a pill to uh, getting an IV in her arm and requiring a medication in that IV, of course, what's going into our arm, because it's going right into our bloodstream, needs to be sterile. And the manufacturing for it's quite complicated. And if there's any problems in the manufacturing of IV solutions, you can easily have to shut down a whole line of manufacturing. So when some companies acquired the right to be the only company making drug X or solution Y, and it was for sterile solutions, if they're the only company making something, if something went wrong in the manufacture process, such as maybe some crystallization happened and there was particulate matter in the supply, that one company would have to shut down manufacture. And if they were the only company making it, there's no relief valve. There's no pressure relief valve. So there's, there's no one else to pick up the slack of the fact that only one company is making product X. And we started to see drug and solution shortages happen in the early part of 2000s. So like I believe like 2001, 2002. And then the FDA needed to actually make a database when there was a shortage. And there have been over 300 drugs and solutions on and off the shortage list in short supply since that time. Think about that. I mean, for anyone who's you know my age and a little bit older, you remember the television show MASH? when they ran out of penicillin and there was a short supply of penicillin and there was all these jokes of, you know, the, the terrible supply lines and how it was like rationing that they had to do for their penicillin. They had to go on the black market and get their penicillin. And as, if you remember the, the episode, they went underneath the bell um, and picked up the penicillin to get for their patients. It was a joke back then. And, you know, I remember thinking to myself, that's so crazy to be in a country that has so many problems that you can't get your hands on penicillin. But that's actually happening today with penicillin. It's happening with chemotherapeutics. I mean, who remembers the story coming from the New York Times in, um, I believe it was fall of 2019, last year, where we had vincristine shortages. So children with chemotherapy, needing chemotherapy, were not able to get their chemotherapy. Well, we've had those shortages for decades. Oncologists tell me they've had to choose which of two patients is going to get whatever chemo happens to be in shortage. Is it going to be the 18-year-old with lymphoma or the 22-year-old with testicular cancer? It's terrible to have to make those decisions. We have shortages in emergency rooms. There's shortages of uh, certain formulations of epinephrine, of heparin. Um, we had Hurricane Maria happen in 2017. And then in 2018, at the beginning of the year, we had a terrible flu year and patients were showing up in hospitals and unable to get IV normal saline, sterilized salt water. You know, the, 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 main, medic, the main solution that we give when someone is dehydrated, which is, you know, the, one of the two main things you're going to die of if you've got the flu. So people were offered Gatorade instead of getting normal saline. Why? Hurricane Maria wiped out the Baxter plant in Puerto Rico and the media and I believe probably, you know, group purchasing organizations took that opportunity to blame shortages on Hurricane Maria when in fact everyone should have been asking themselves, why is there only one manufacturer of that normal saline? Why is there only one or two manufacturers of the vincristine that was in shortage? Why is there only one or two manufacturers of heparin or epinephrine? And if you look at the list of drug shortages, there's over 150 on the FDA website. Um, if you look at those drugs that are and solutions that are in shortage, 90% of them have either a single or two manufacturers. And it's because these are companies that bought the sole source right to manufacture the product to get it in to the hospitals through the group purchasing organizations, into the nursing homes, through the group purchasing organizations. And then when something goes wrong with the supply or a, a problem with the manufacturer, there's, there's no way you can ramp up supply when you're shutting down and trying to make up um, where, the, where the supply comes from. So then what happens to the patient? They suffer with a shortage. Uh, and what happens to the physician? 
they have to MacGyver their way around a shortage. So in stories that I've heard from around the country, even before COVID hit, you know, ER doctors were telling me, uh, I had one ER doctor that told me we had a shortage of naloxone and they couldn't reverse an overdose and they had to intubate the patient until they could scare up some naloxone because there wasn't any in the ER. They had to scare it up from a, another location in the hospital. I've had obstetricians tell me my patient came in with premature labor. Um, standard of care for a mom in premature labor is to get a steroid IM shot, intermuscular injection of beta-methasone, which matures the baby's lungs. And mature lungs are the number one reason, you know, the lung maturity is the, um, the main thing that's going to determine whether the baby survives or not, and then the baby's morbidity as well. Well, they've only got one dose that they can give a mom, and the mom should have gotten two. And if they have the one dose, then that, I guess that's good luck as well. So we're short on drugs in the, the OB sector. You know, the anesthesiologists tell me, um, you know, the anesthesiologists, the ones who have to take women and when it's time for them to have a C-section, put the spinal in. Um, so a mom that needs to have a C-section Spinal anesthesia is a lot safer way to go than general anesthesia, but when you lack bupivacaine, the safest anesthetic for uh, using spinal anesthesia, the safest anesthetic for mom and baby, there's a shortage of that. So moms sometimes are having to be put under general anesthesia to have their C-sections. That happens, and that's a bigger risk for mom and baby. My cardiologists are telling me, um, I wrote actually this particular story in the Washington Times, came from a rural hospital in Georgia. The physician um, was called into the ER. The patient was a 72-year-old man whose electrolytes, blood chemistries, were all out of whack, and the pH was excessively low. The heart rate was 20, which is incompatible with life. The patient had a skewed calcium level, so they were twitching slightly. So the cardiologist asked for a, um, an ampule of bicarbonate solution, baking soda water. And he was told, there's none. You can't have it. It's in shortage. There's a national problem. So instead of giving an amp of bicarb to normalize the patient's pH, which would have taken their heart the direction it needed to go in, this cardiologist now had to thread a pacing wire down um, the neck vein of a patient who's twitching. So they had to do an invasive procedure because we're lacking a solution. So in all of these scenarios, what happens is the patient has some type of danger that the doctor has to work around. And physicians, you know, many more of us are employed than we had been. And the conditions of our employment are, you know, we're, we're always worried, you know, is it possible that someone will not like how we handle the patient? We're run by administrators. We're not run by physicians. And if we're going to be telling the patient that they're getting suboptimal care, are our jobs at risk? So many times, the patient isn't told how the shortage had to be worked around. So the patients remain unaware of the shortages. The doctors are all aware. You know, there's a, an ER group that I'm aware of that they did an informal survey and they had uh, almost a thousand responses on the survey and every single doctor had dealt with a drug shortage at one time or another. So the supply chain has been broken for a long time and then COVID brought it to national attention because the patients wouldn't have seen it. The physicians weren't telling them, but now patients and nurses are also lacking the equipment that we needed, our, our shields that we needed in order to go battle COVID. So we were sent to battle without the shields that we needed. And as a result, you know, the, the nation is now very keenly aware of the problems within the supply line. So it's been interesting because there's physicians around the country that have heard about this problem and are aware of uh, group purchasing organizations and the control that they have over the supply line. And now they're seeing it and they're living it, the, pa the physicians and the nurses in the hospital. And I think we're at a really, we're at a bad spot, of course, you know, this is no good to have a pandemic, but when we talk about the potential silver linings in the cloud of COVID, one thing might be that we have brought national attention to our dysfunctional and broken supply line, and maybe we can turn our supply chain, our healthcare supply chain, 
back into a market in which many more companies can participate, smaller companies included, not have to pay these kickbacks because kickbacks really, they shouldn't be, they should not be legal in any sector of our economy. They're going to be causing shortages like this. Shortages are going to drive up existing prices and shortages are going to cause, you know, more medical problems and um, issues with, uh, with patient safety and now with physician, nurse, and other healthcare worker safety because of the lack of PPE. I was just telling somebody that the quote I got was, this should be mandatory for every med student. Um, and the follow-up to that was, the general public should be hearing this information, but students, this should be a requirement. And I couldn't agree more. Um, I got a question about, uh, it was earlier on in what you were saying is, um, aren't you speaking of a monopoly? Why are drug companies allowed to do this as opposed to other industries? Um, you were speaking of, it was very early on in what you were talking about. Let me see if I Yeah, can that's okay. okay. Yeah, I'll, you know what, I'm going to address both things. Okay. So I keep on, I keep on actually saying words to try to, I'll, I'll use the medical word first. You know, you heard me say normal saline, and then I'll explain that it's sterilized salt water. I'm really hoping that physicians and students that are watching this, you know, share this with their families, with their patients, and with others, because it's, it's really going to be the public pressure that allows us to fix all of these problems. Um, so I want, I want you to understand that it's, it's your daughter who might be pregnant and the baby she's carrying is at risk, you know, for not getting appropriate medical care because we have these shortages. It's your child or yourself that might be at risk because you don't have chemotherapy. It's your grandfather, or your grandma that's going to be at risk if they show up with a heart rate of 20, which is not compatible with life, and they have to have a dangerous and invasive procedure. I mean, it's great that physicians have worked their way around these problems, but you are having care that is less safe because of these shortages. It's more dangerous for your health. It's going to be more costly just by its description. I mean, think about if, you know, you can't have spinal anesthesia for any one of 25 different procedures. Now you're going to have general anesthesia. You're going to have more side effects from that. You're going to have a longer hospitalization. Your costs are up. You know, we need to start getting real about healthcare. So I really, I love what the person said. Everyone should be watching this. You should all be aware of, of drug shortages. Um, you brought up the term monopoly and why is it allowed? Well, it's, it's actually a series of monopolies, and in a healthcare, it will in any supply chain that's called a monopsony. So when you look through and you discover that there's there's only like three companies that are making insulin, you know they've cornered the market. Those three companies, when there's only one company that's making most of the saline that gets into the United States, they've cornered the market. When you have a whole series, saline, bicarb, pitocin. Um, uh, epinephrine, heparin, only one company making the supply when it's a whole series of monopolies, we call that a monospony. Why is it allowed? Th these companies, these group purchasing organizations, are they're doing what's legal because Congress legalized it for them. In 1987, they got the very special ability to be able to take a kickback. You know, think about that. You know, if if I as a physician was able to give money, you know, out there and say that like, you know, the Marion Mass brand of medicine is, you know, the, the best one. And I was able to purchase market share in my region, in my arena, purchase that market share. If I got a couple of big backers, I could take over the whole operation. You know, if you became the only person making pens that got into schools, then, you know, you were going to prosper. So, Congress legalized it in 1987, and at the time, you know, this is, this is interesting, you know, people say, well, can you show us the proof that this money is changing hands? I can't see it myself, and right now, you can't see it either, but the oversight in this law was that the uh, Health and Human Secretary uh, Department, OIG Department, the Office of Inspector General, the HHS OIG was allowed to ask to see the contracts at any time. And initially, I believe the contracts were limited 
the kickback was a percentage of the, you know, the cost of the product, which of course, actually, as an aside, you realize they're going to want costlier products because if you have a more expensive product, <laughs> you're going to get a bigger kickback. So we're perversely incentivized to pick expensive products. But um, the small percentage that it was, there's no way of us knowing for sure if that percentage is held to. And there's no way of us seeing how expensive the kickbacks have become. Um, there are parts of you know, manufacturers that are starting to complain about the excess cost of the kickbacks. Most notably, last year, there was a drug pricing talks that were held in the Senate Finance Committee. I actually attended the first one live and uh, attended the second two online. And I wrote uh, an op-ed about each of them in my the paper that I'm on the editorial board of, the Bucks County Courier Times. Um, and, you know, when I attended you could see when the pharmaceutical companies were grilled, they started to leak the fact that these kickbacks, which have been euphemistically called rebates, um, and it's not fair that they're called rebates because a rebate makes it makes you feel like you're getting something as the consumer when in fact the money's flowing to the middlemen. So the pharmaceutical companies started squealing the fact that the rebates are are now, that's what drives the market share. And it's, kind of like almost like a bribe to get your product into the system and to be able to monopolize all or a large portion of the system. Um, I'll add that, uh, you know, those talks were about drug pricing. I was talking about hospital middlemen, the group purchasing organizations or GPOs, and I'll keep repeating that, you know, name so that you know the GPOs are the middlemen for hospitals and nursing homes. Um, but an interesting thing happened in 2003. The HHS uh, extended kickback rights to pharmacy benefit managers or PBMs. Most Americans did not know about GPOs, the hospital and nursing home middlemen, until we had COVID. You know, and then we could see that there was a broken hospital supply chain. But a lot of Americans have heard about PBMs or pharmacy benefit managers. Um, their models are a little bit different. What the two groups share is this. They both have the right to legalize kickbacks, and I don't think that exists anywhere else in, in American industry. The legal right to receive kickbacks and not get prosecuted. And, you know, just think about the monopolization and the cost that is added to you for the very fact that these large, rich industries have a special right that no one else has. There's something wrong with that. And it's one of the things that I say all the time to lawmakers because they kind of argue back and they say, well, won't we disrupt the supply chain if we get rid of kickbacks? And I just like stop in my tracks and say, why should any industry in America have the right to legalize kickbacks? That is just too ripe a conflict of interest, too perverse an incentive for anyone to have because they'll, they'll make use of it, they'll capitalize off of it, and they'll gouge America with that right. So in any case, I was uh, getting back to HHS extended the kickback right to pharmacy benefit managers. Pharmacy benefit managers are PBMs. Most Americans have heard of them because if you've taken a medication, it's rolled through your pharmacy benefits that come to you through your insurance companies. And the big three, and I bet almost every American has heard of either CVS Caremark or Express Scripts or Optum. Those are the big three pharmacy benefit managers. And what has happened to PBMs over time, you know, PBMs started, initially they were the formulary makers. So they were the, um, the industry that decided what got covered by your healthcare insurance and at what tier it got covered by. So now I've just told you that they have the right to receive kickbacks too. So for your outpatient pharmacy prescriptions, it's a pay to play market to get to be on the formulary. I mean, how can you think anything otherwise, other than if the people who are making the formularies, determining what gets paid for by your insurance can get paid for by the pharmaceutical companies? Well, that explains why there's three companies only making insulin. And then those companies can do what they want with the prices. But the very fact that the PBMs can accept that kickback, big pharmaceutical is only too happy 
to cough up the, the kickback, which they call a rebate. And I refuse to call a rebate. I say hashtag call them kickbacks. Um, Big Pharma can afford the kickbacks and get the product onto the formulary. And then that becomes what is covered. And the Americans, you know, that are taking the medications are none the wiser. So as a famous example, I think all of us probably know someone uh, that suffers with food allergies. One in 13 American children have a life-threatening food allergies and need to carry injectable epinephrine, auto-injectable epinephrine. You know, it's most famously known as EpiPen because EpiPen cornered the market. The company Mylan um, became the company making most of the auto-injectable epinephrine in the United States. There was one last holdout uh, a medication, uh, another brand name uh, called AviQ, the talking EpiPen. It got pulled off the market, and then the company, I believe, tried to get back in um, the the people who made the product, but were unable to get past what we call the rebate wall. I mean, I call it the kickback wall. But then the cost of EpiPen went through the roof. And in addition, we started to see shortages of injectable epinephrine. Um, I met a patient that, two-year-old patient, beautiful little child on Medicaid insurance. And the mother, um, this child actually had a severe allergy to bee stings. And I just casually mentioned the child was in, in uh, being seen for something else. I casually asked if they, they had access to their auto-injectable epinephrine. And she said, oh no, we were just told to avoid bees since last October. It had been six months. I was like, excuse me, avoid bees? Well, there's a back order. There's been a shortage of the EpiPen. I was totally floored, you know? I mean, so to see it live in front of me, I mean, you know, you know it exists. That was the first I had heard of the shortage of injectable epinephrine, but when you're staring the patient in the face, you're, you're just totally stunned. I did give her the manufacturer's name of the AviQ and suggested to her she could get in touch with them and obtain a, an injectable uh, pen for her child so that he might not get a bee sting and, and die. I mean, you're putting children's life at risk. What is wrong with people that they carry on allowing these monopolies, these small monopolies and a greater monosophy of all these products so that people are unsafe and that the costs are higher? And we're seeing this in the hospital space with all supplies, devices, medications, solutions. And we're seeing it in the outpatient pharmaceutical space with, um, with medications and injectables. Another, we have a lot of a lot of great comments talking about you know the difference between letting the market decide versus um, you know is this a regulatory problem or is this letting the market decide? But also, are people making who are making these decisions? Um, are they doctors or is this is this government? Um, you know, is this is this what the government is doing to us? Is this business as usual? Um, or are these doctors making the decisions? Or I think I, it's always, a I always love that question. <laughs> no, that's okay. I think it's a combination of business and government. Um, if you go to the PPA website, we have a blog, and uh, there's a, a blog that I wrote about PPA testifying in Harrisburg. I testified in Harrisburg about non-medical switching. A non-medical switching is something that the insurance company works with the PBM and um, uh, let me actually to answer the question, let me segue a little bit. Insurance companies have either historically been tied to PBMs or they became tied to PBMs. And um, you can look at uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield has its own in house PBM and has for years. It's called Prime Therapeutics. So they already owned PBM and you know, didn't have to purchase one. Uh, at one point, um, United Healthcare, you know, many, many customers, one of the biggest in America, of course, uh, they became aligned with an organization formerly known as Ingenex. Um, Ingenex got nailed for healthcare IT fraud, rebranded itself as Optum, and it's now one of the big three PBMs, but it's an arm of United Healthcare. So Optum and United were united. <laughs> and then within the last two years, um, 
you can see that uh, CVS purchased uh, Aetna. So, you know, 22 million Aetna customers lying around and CVS purchased Aetna for $62 billion. Uh, and I might add that uh, for those listening, CVS, you know, use all those brick and mortar stores and that little robotic heart that you see. Um, CVS gets 60% of its revenue from its PBM division, CVS Caremark. So CVS Caremark is the PBM division of the big CVS entity. 60% of its revenue is coming from its PBM. Think about that for a minute. There's all those brick and mortar stores. There's the pharmacies. There's now Aetna, but CVS is earning most of its revenues, more, more than you know, 50%, 60% of it, through its PBM. That should tell you something right there. PBMs are big money makers. Uh, and then the last one was the merging of uh, Cigna purchased Express Scripts. So it's almost as though these insurance companies scrambled to purchase PBMs. Um, I'll, I'll hold off on talking about one of the other reasons why I think they did that. But um, when I testified, I asked that same question myself and some of the lawmakers asked it when I testified in Harrisburg to the, I think it was the consumer um, relations division of the, uh, of the uh, Pennsylvania house. But they asked the question, like who was making these decisions? And they all told us, the PBMs told us, well, we have a, um, we have pharmacists that are on our board that are making the decisions. Well, what help is that? If you're CVS and you have pharmacists that are employed by CVS and CVS Caremark is able to take the kickbacks, you have an employee that's making your decisions. I mean, and if you have enough money to be paying to purchase insurance companies, which aren't exactly the most revered institutions in America, you know, you have enough money to be able to pick the person that you want, who is your employee, who's on that board making the decisions as to what medications are put on that formulary. So some of those people could be physicians, I suppose, you know, and I'm, I would never say that physicians, every single one of them is without conflict. I mean, I, I certainly think that there's gems and warts in every profession and there's probably some physicians who have sold out and have gone to become medical directors or PBMs. So um, there could be physicians in there, but I think the very nature of the fact that the PBM is allowed to take the kickback is a problem. Um, I did want to actually add in that the merging of insurance companies and, um, and PBMs is especially problematic when you have these big pharmaceutical, you know, uh, brick and mortar stores involved. So you think of what CVS now has and what they have as a greater, wider monopoly and a group of conflicts of interest. So CVS, when they announced that merger, they said that their whole purpose was so that they could increase the number of CVS minute clinics. <laughs> I like to call them drive-by minute clinics <laughs> because I don't, I cannot imagine that anyone would put their trust in the care of a clinic that you would go to. And, and the, when they announced the clinics, they announced there were no physicians involved. So they're using non-physician providers, and that's their business with their clinics. It, however, you know, medical care itself is defined. The gold standard is physician-led care. So they're already, CVS itself, is defining medical care in their own way. You walk into that minute clinic, and now you have someone who's employed by CVS, and CVS itself is perversely incentivized to pick a high price drug for you if you need, they're picked to, to choose a drug at all, you know, because if they, if they pick a medication as the solution to whatever problem you're having, they're going to make money through their PBM. And they're also perversely incentivized to pick an expensive one because the kickback, which they like to call rebate, is going to be higher because the higher the cost of the medication, the higher the kickback, the higher the rebate. So you're seeing a clinician that is not a physician who's perversely incentivized by their employer to select a medication as the solution to your problem, to select an expensive medication to your problem. And by the way, while you're there, they can tell you to go to aisle four, five, and six and pick out items X, Y, and Z. And they have you as a captive audience in their store 
where their minute clinic exists. What a welter of conflicts of interest. Who would trust this model? It's absolutely absurd. Sorry, I'm sure someone else has some questions, so carry on. I clearly could talk for <laughs> <laughs> the we, afternoon. We, and, and it's, I think this is a topic, we have such a great group that is, at least the names that I'm aware of, we have stu current medical students, we have at least one resident, we also have a former college Republican, at least one, that has just been admitted um, to medical school. Um, you know, we have uh, private citizen patients, um, you know, we have phys current physicians. This is such a great group that is attending this today. Um, and, you know, a lot of the comments, I'm looking at Facebook, um, I'm looking at the comments that are coming in, and it's a lot more comments than questions, which is fantastic. What is next? What do we do now? Um, and knowing who our audience is, which is so broad and, um, you know, it really is the, you know, we all fight in our coalition and free to care. It's fighting for the, you know, patient physician um, relationship and making sure that that is the most important thing in everything that we do. Um, what do we do? What is, you know, you're going to these hearings in your writing, which is part of what at BRI we're talking about advocacy and what um, these not only uh, medical students, but when they become doctors, what they can do, and we're talking about the different advocacy pieces, what, what can, um, you know, both patients and physicians and medical students, um, what can they do? Right, okay, so first of all, I'm like really glad for the question because um, I will tell you, your voices, all of your voices are important. America's really supposed to be run by we the people, and we all recognize that it's not, you know, someone brought up is this business, is this government, well, the, the conglomeration of business paying off government to get what they want so that we have quasi-monopolies all over healthcare is our problem. We have monopolizations of big hospital systems, monopolizations of PBMs, monopolizations of GPOs, monopolizations of insurance companies, because we all know there's like five major ones that are running most of the show. Um, so all of those people are pushing back to the government and mm -hmm, donating very heavily, unfortunately, and making sure that their voice is heard and they're busy writing, doing what they can, control the media. So what I tell people is at least become aware of where your money's going in healthcare. Um, and, you know, what we try to do is with uh, Free to Care, if you go to that website, free, the number two in care, you can read the white paper that details how we can reduce cost and waste in healthcare. And there's a lot of free market ideas there. And, you know, I think that um, you know, this is a free market conversation, but what I tell people all the time, I mean, I lean right, I'm a fiscal conservative. I don't understand why everyone isn't a fiscal conservative, uh, but I know a, an awful lot of patients that lean left that see concurrence with these ideas. And I think the reason is, is because Free market is not a conservative ideal. It's an American ideal. You know, if, you, if we first define free market as uh, the ability of any market to have transparency in pricing, transparency in quality, and the ability for participation because you have fair rules for everyone, then when we think about it, Free market isn't conservative at all. It's American. I mean, America was built by your ability to start a small company, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, create an opportunity for yourself. And those things are gone in settings of the healthcare supply chain because we don't have transparency of product. You know, the very fact that you can purchase your way, your product into the system it tells you that there's no quality measure to get the product in there. And there's no competition because you just buy it, you buy it off. And then the transparency in pricing, well, that's gone too. And the transparency in knowing what the rebates are, the only person that could see them is that HHS OIG. And the HHS OIG has never asked to see those rebate contracts. 
So, you know, keep that in mind. I'm going to get to the what you can do and what we should be asking for. But first of all, read that paper. Understand, and I know it's 34 pages, but there's a lot of references, and I swear that not every page is like a full page. And, and I think it's actually entertaining, and, and um, the cadence of the paper flows quite nicely. If you break it up in maybe like four nights, you don't have to read all 35 pages at once. But read the paper and understand where we're wasting money in healthcare. Um, and then part two, start encouraging other people to do the same. And then start demanding things that belong in a free market, like price transparency and like transparency for these contracts. Um, there's nothing preventing you from calling your lawmaker and saying the number one of the things that you should consider doing is introducing a bill to repeal kickbacks that have been legalized in the healthcare supply chain and then provide their staffer or provide them with the paper because it describes it in the first um, whole section of the paper. Uh, so the other thing that you could do if they're not willing to do that is push on them to start demanding for hearings so that the HHS OIG is revealing looking at these kickback contracts and dissecting and deciding what's been happening to the level of the kickbacks and why. I mean, we need some transparency in, in that supply chain and we don't have any. Um, and then lastly, start asking the question of your physicians, start asking the questions of your attendings. Do you get to pick the products that you're using? I mean, that's a really great question, you know? You know, I've talked to orthopedic surgeons who have told me I used to have a certain screw that I used for orthopedic procedures, and now I have this other screw, and it's not working so well. Cardiologists don't get to pick their pacemakers that they're putting in. Um, anesthesiologists have told me I used to have a certain cut-down tray that worked really great so that I could uh, put in central lines for patients, and now I have this terrible cut-down tray. It's not made very well. So our supply lines are declining in, in the realm of quality. We don't get to decide that, but we should. It's these group purchasing organizations who are doing so. And you know, lastly, make sure that you're aware of who they are. We explain a lot in the white paper, but you, know, you might have the idea that group purchasing organizations for hospitals and nursing homes and PBMs for uh, outpatient pharmaceutical products are the ones that are actually having the big warehouse and shipping things around. Oh no, they don't even do that. They essentially act like a bunch of bookies that are writing the contracts to figure out what gets into the hospital and the nursing home or what gets on the formulary. There's a whole other separate set of middlemen that are actually doing the running for them. Um, we call those the distributors, Cardinal, McKesson, and Amerisource Bergen. And a lot of Americans have heard of them as well because they're getting their pants sued off for maldistributing opioids all over the country. But these three big companies, Cardinal, McKesson, and Amerisource Bergen, all seem to have a special relationship with the GPOs and the PBMs. I mean, it's very possible that there's kickbacks that they pay to get to have the special relationships. Isn't that something? <laughs> and we're, as I mentioned, talking about some of the people who are now taking heat and bearing the partial blame for the opioid crisis. Not necessarily nice people. And by the way, if you go look up the S&P Fortune 500, you will see those names all in the top 25. Cardinal, McKesson, Amerisource Bergen, CVS, I think United is in there. Um, a, lot of these, a lot of these industries, they're all there. I mean, we're talking the top 20 of Fortune 500. These are big money makers. No wonder healthcare is so expensive. Toss me something else. I feel like I answer the question and then go off in 16 different directions right. because it is so complicated. You know, you, we're going to have David Ballot from uh, talking about price transparency on Monday the 29th. So I, I think it's a, good, it's a good segue there. You know, this is all, it is all interconnected. This is, this is what we all need to have. We need to be talking about all of these things. Uh, someone asked, going into kind of the interconnectedness a little bit, if we were to eliminate these rebates, um, would it not make medicine more affordable to more people? Um, talking about kind of the affordability and the transparency of everything. Um, there's also a question, how can we know who to trust in getting the best possible drugs and healthcare? care? Um, those are two questions that just came in. 
No worries. Um, I think in terms of if we re got rid of the rebates, yeah, I do think we'd make healthcare much more affordable. Would it disrupt the system initially? Of course it would. Isn't this a system that begs disruption? Yes, it is. So even though we're going to be disrupted for a little time and people are going to be running around like my chickens do in my backyard, like, <laughs> let's, there's a bug over there, run after that bug. You know, we're all going to follow each other. Even though we'll be running around and not, you know, we, we're going to have some lag time until we start ramping up production and having competition in between small companies, yeah, we're going to disrupt the market. Conservative estimates are that these um, kickbacks suck out oh, $200 billion per year. Did you all hear that? $200 billion per year are going to companies that do no distribution, no manufacture, no research. What are they doing? They're simply these Rolodexes to figure out what's going to go on formularies and go in hospitals. And you know, furthermore, if you think about even just the hospital supply chain, with what we have with computers now, like why is there not just a big clearinghouse of lists and people going on bidding wars for what they'll sell their bag of normal sailing for or their box of bandages? Or, you know, uh, if you can prove that you have a good medical device and you can get it out in the market and it passes FDA muster and, you know, physicians become aware of its utility and its features and then can choose things for their patients and be a portion of the ordering process, that would be a whole lot of a better way uh, in, terms of, um, in terms of competition. Um, there, see, I talked too much. The second question, oh, how can we help determine the quality? That actually answers a little bit of that. Um, you know, I think one of the ways that you determine quality is, is that the patient themselves can see it and feel it with the physician because they have a bond. But in terms of getting quality medications, we are in real trouble. I mean, I guess I can't see you raise your hand. I wish I could because when I give lectures, I, I tell people, hey, raise your hand out there if you have heard that there are medications that are being recalled because we found out they're made in China and they have carcinogens in them. And then people raise their hand, right? So last year we had um, Losartan, a very commonly used antihypertensive and Zantac were pulled off the shelves because we found out they were tainted with carcinogens. They were made in China. And when you're me and you show up at you know, FDA symposiums on drug shortages, you learn that pharmaceutical companies are allowed to outsource their production overseas. And then the company, the, the product gets shipped here to America and they put an American pharmaceutical label on it and up it goes on the shelves. Didn't know that, did you? <laughs> but yes, that's what's going on. And the problem is, is that in China and other countries, their, you know, contamination standards are not as high as ours. That's a problem. Do you want carcinogens in, in your Zantac, in your antihypertensives? I mean, how are we to know? Maybe we've been poisoning ourselves and causing more cancers than we ever realized. And if these are just the only medications that we happen to find the carcinogens in, what else has got carcinogens in it? So I think until we onshore more of our medications here, that's going to be a problem. There was just a new private-public partnership announced last month. Um, the admi presidential administration uh, helped to get funding for a company called Flow, P-H-L-O-W. And uh, the idea behind Flow is they're going to start to manufacture uh, pharmaceuticals here um, in America in a company in, in Richmond, Virginia, uh, and they're going to start with several generics. And um, it's really exciting. It looks like some very good people are on the board. Uh, one of the experts in the problem with offshoring to China is a woman named Rosemary Gibson of the Hastings Institute. Um, she's actually a personal friend and a mentor to me, um, and she's been an amazing advocate she wrote a book called China RX, and she's one of the people on the board of FLOW. And, you know, it, it gives me a lot of faith and trust to know that someone of Rosemary's stature and um, commitment level and uh, her moral compass is helping to run such a company that's a public-private partnership. Um, in addition, 
I've seen a few bills floating around out there. Um, Tim Scott, a senator from South Carolina, and Buddy Carter, a congressman from the Savannah, Georgia area, who's a former pharmacist, actually. And uh, I've spoken with him about the PBMs, and he's aware of the problems. They recently introduced a bill to stimulate uh, within opportunity zones, which are locations of America that are, you know, um, economically disadvantaged. So usually inner cities or very, very poor rural places. These opportunity zones will have uh, grant money. There's already existing grants for opportunity zones to start producing uh, all kinds of healthcare supplies. Um, I believe it's mainly uh, medications and solutions that they were mentioning. But to try, this is an effort to try to bring back manufacturing to America. And like these are, um, it's two Republican Congress people that I mentioned, Senator and the Congressperson. But you know, these are nonpartisan issues. We should all want these opportunity zones to be able to ramp up and have good sustainable jobs in them and the jobs that come out of a small company that can be built within an opportunity zone those jobs will be sustainable if there's no excess baggage of needing to have to pay the kickback to get your product into the system you know we should want those kickbacks to go away so these jobs in the opportunity zones these great manufacturing jobs can be sustainable and if you think about like making medical products here in America um, the, the labor is much, much cheaper in China. We might end up paying overall a little bit more. We might get better quality, but we're also going to be able to create jobs at many different levels. I mean, if you picture what a company is from the time the company needs to be built, so there's the construction that goes into the building of the company and the technical aspects of making equipment to punch out pills or um, manufacture sterile solutions, you're going to need engineering help for that. You're going to need the business help to get that all running. You're going to need like line jobs for people, factory type jobs for people. Um, you're going to need you know the the administrative secretarial jobs for the people that are you know helping to run the company as well. You're going to have jobs across a broad swath of you know uh, of people's personal economics. How wonderful that would be! Why are we not all fighting for this? And then. You also, at the same time, create, get, you get rid of the problem with quality of our own supply and put a little more trust. I mean, if we can't trust the products that we're recommending by prescription, are we going to get compliance? And then you have the downstream effects of that. So did a lot, another lot of talking. I'll let you interrupt me and tell me what other questions. Actually, you just, you actually answered um, two of the same questions that came in about, um, you know, outsourcing the manufacturing and bringing it in. Um, we we are at an hour now. Um, <laughs> we just got thank you, thank you. Why are our country leaders not listening to you more? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I've been telling them for two years. I feel like they pat me on the head and say, "How oh, sweet, go along." <laughs> well, you know, to as we're as we're completing, it's, if you have any more questions, please let me know. Um, you can also, you know, as we're wrapping this up, um, we will be making this video. It's going to be immediately available on our Facebook page, but we will be making this available on our YouTube, um, on our YouTube channel. So the link will be available. I encourage you, as we've done with all of our virtual events, I encourage you to take that link, pass it along, um, not as promotion for Benjamin Rush Institute, but as promotion for this very important topic. Um, you know, we have had direct primary care um, e events with uh, Kim Corba um, go to uh, you know, small groups in Florida because they're they want more people to under more students to understand what DPC is. You know, take these links and pass them on to other medical students, to people who don't understand just how broken um, our healthcare supply chain is, um, to your friends who don't understand that what that means when there is a PPE, but also when there's drug shortages, um, that it goes far beyond what is going on um, in COVID, that it's going to expand way past this and that it already has um, hurt 
their how a doctor is treating them. Um, you know, that we can do stuff about this. So take this link, pass it on. Um, if you do have further questions, you can get in touch with me. My contact information is going to be on the page um, and I can get you in touch uh, with Dr. Mary and Mass. Dr. Mass, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, this has been just incredibly eye-opening for me and I, I hear this stuff all the time, but also I know for our students, for our medical student-to-be, which congratulations, Eli, um, but Rats. also, <laughs> but also um, for the people who are our patients, um, this is so important for you to know and that you can also reach out to your congressman, to your senators, um, to people in your state uh, and get this information out there. Um, Thank you so much. Uh, we will be with Dr. Rebecca Bernard uh, talking about uh, physician-led care next Friday uh, at 12 noon Eastern time. And then the following Monday um, on the 29th, uh, talking about price transparency, also a good issue um, and very relevant right now. So thank you so much. Um, and uh, my contact information will be on slides following this. So thank you very much, Dr. Mass. It was my great pleasure. I'll be happy to answer any questions. I'm just going to echo what you said. Find one or two people in your life that get things done. Have them watch this. And, you know, I can provide other information and links to them if they need to learn more because we need to get on top of this. Now's our time to make this happen. Thank you for everything you do. And good luck and congratulations to all the medical students. I love being a physician. It's a great career. Thank you so much.